When I throw out the term salesperson, let's say you're on the receiving end of a sales call. So someone tells you, this salesperson wants to meet with you. What adjectives immediately come to mind when you think salesperson? You just shout them out. Pushy? All right, so we got pushy. Pushy, what else? Rude? Rude? Beautiful. What else? Bullshitter? All right, can I abbreviate? Do you mind? Just in the interest of space. Suffice to say, not very positive terms, right? And this is a room of people largely focused on sales. So if we're thinking this, you think it's possible that when your salespeople, no matter, no matter how authentic they are, when they show up for a meeting, do you think it's possible that the customers think of the same thing? You bet they are. So we've got very much of an uphill battle that we face because there's a whole bunch of people who earned these adjectives along the way. And if we come across as that pushy, rude, self-serving salesperson, we run the risk of making a very bad first impression. And if you make that bad first impression, you can't recover. So one of the things we're gonna do is I wanna get you into the mind of the buyer. Here are the three things that, that, um, that we reached in terms of conclusion, it's this. First one comes down to why do we need it? What problem does it solve? The second thing basically is a function of our confidence in how likely the results or outcome are. And what I mean by that is the reason we ask for references, the reason we want to go do a site visit, reason customers ask for all that is because they're uncomfortable about whether or not they're going to see the outcomes that your pushy, self-interested salesperson is alleging they're going to get. So they want to talk to somebody to get that confidence. That's what it is. So it comes down to that likelihood of an outcome or result. The third one is this whole why you, meaning why are we buying from them? Why don't we buy from somebody else? Why don't we do it ourselves? In essence, what are the alternatives for it? But here's the interesting thing. When I take this deeper in workshops with companies, what we find is this. Why you is a distant third to the other two. You would think, but Ian, that's like one of the most important things. Here's the thing. When the buyer feels that the company does a great job of understanding the problem they're going to solve for them, and they understand why they need it, and the company they're most comfortable will deliver the results with high likelihood, that's who you're going with. So if you do a great job on the first two, the third one becomes somewhat automatic. The interesting thing, though, is that a lot of us don't communicate in this type of pattern with our clients. So if this is the way people make decisions, and this is how they base approvals and base decisions on this sort of pattern, if your sales organization is not communicating and answering these questions proactively, what does that do to the sales cycle if you're not following this model? Lengthen it or shorten it? It lengthens it. Because what happens is that the customer, the buyer, has to translate whatever you said into this formula to make a decision. But if we can communicate this way, it makes it a whole lot easier for them. Because let's face it, half the time they go for approval, what they have is some sort of document that says, here's what we're selling you for how much. And the person approving it, the first thing that goes in their head is what? Why do we need it? What problems does it solve for us? Are we confident that we're likely to get the outcomes these people allege we're going to get? What if every time you submit a document, it said, here's a summary of what you explained to us, Mr. Customer, was important to you and why you had to solve this problem. Here's what we're proposing to address that. And here's what other people have seen for results and why we've agreed that you're, you're likely to see those. Now someone's going to approve that. You've got what, what I call a concise business case as part of your offer. What I mean by this is we want to focus on why people need what we do rather than what. And in that context, when we talk about what we do, it doesn't really mean much. And I'm going to give you a formula for how we come up with a pitch, what we call a same side pitch, that's going to catch people's attention a little bit better and it's going to actually entice them to be interested in what we have to say. First, we need to entice somebody by sharing problems that we solve 
with extraordinary results. We need to disarm the notion that we're just there to sell them something by acknowledging that we can't help everybody. And then we must trigger a discovery phase where we learn more about their situation to see whether or not we can help. Because the fact is this, even though we'd love to help everybody, the fact is we can't help even half the people that we encounter. It might, be, it might have nothing to do with us. They just might not be mentally prepared to make a change that we would come in with. They may not be ready for what we do. Their organization may not be structured to take advantage of the product or service that you offer. Or they might have requirements that, candidly, you're not the best people to meet. And other people can, other organizations can meet those needs better.